This is Janet Meyer from the Augsburg College Oral History Project. I'm here to interview Dave Wold about his experiences as um, campus pastor at Augsburg College. We are at Pastor Dave's home in Arden Hills, Minnesota. Today is March 7th, 2015. Thank you for participating in this. You're welcome. Um, would you please start by giving us um, information about your background and education. Okay. I uh, <clears throat> was uh, a preacher's kid, so I lived in five different towns uh, growing up. Born in Wadena, Minnesota. Lived there just briefly because my dad had just taken a call. And moved to Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Had my preschool years there. And then to Red Wing, Minnesota, where I did elementary school. And then uh, Fort Worth, Texas, where I did junior high and part of high school. And then finished high school in St. Paul. Went on to St. Olaf College. From there to Luther Seminary. And then uh, I served with my father for a few years. We said that was the father and son looking for the Holy Ghost. And that, that was a wonderful experience. Uh, then to... Uh, a very large church in Golden Valley. Um, I was actually always thinking that I might go to medical school, and so I was actually taking, uh, filling out what I needed in terms of medical courses or pre-med courses at the U uh, on the side. But then this opportunity came up, a rare opportunity, as they said, to have the largest youth Lutheran youth program in the country, and that was at a church in Golden Valley. And then I was thinking again about maybe medical school or graduate school, and then another rare opportunity came up, and that was to head our denominations youth program. And I did that for a few years, but I was traveling 200 days a year, at least, and I'd sometimes be, well, in, in the summer, seven, eight, nine weeks in East Germany, wasn't even able to communicate with my family. And one night, uh, one of my daughters, who was about two at the time, said to my wife, is daddy coming over tonight? And I knew, wow, that's a kind of a wake-up call. And uh, just about that time, the, our denomination, which was the American Lutheran Church, had voted to merge with another denomination, it's called Lutheran, Lutheran Church of America, as well as the a smaller group called the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches, AELC, I think that was the name, which was a break off from the Missouri Synod. And they were going to form the larger church, which is now the ELCA. So I knew this was, this was a, a time maybe to look at something else. And somebody just at that time said, I noticed there is an opening at Augsburg College for a uh, college pastor. Can I nominate you? And I said, yes, you can nominate me. So I was nominated, and and uh, I guess as happens with most positions at a college, you have hundreds of people apply. So I didn't take it as seriously as as uh, as uh, you know maybe uh, uh, I could have at the time. But I went through the interviews. It was a extensive interview, maybe a half dozen committees for I think a couple, three days, and one thing led to the next and pretty soon I was called to be college pastor at Augsburg. Great. And that was wonderful because I I was able to to be with my family every night at least, <laughs> even though it was, the hours were long and, uh, and it was always um, there's always work to be done, but uh, but I was in town, yeah. and that was uh, that was a real blessing. So so that's kind of uh, my vocational journey, and then uh, I ended up being there 30 years. Yeah. So great. Yeah. Um. So what attracted you to the position? Well, I had you know I was thinking that I was going to go on to medical school or some form of graduate school, uh, but I think probably because of um, the change in, in the, 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 what was going, going on with the denomination, the merger, that 
it was sort of what you call a Kairos time to think about something else because I knew I liked the Twin Cities and and the, the office was going to be in Chicago so I would have probably had to move if I continued in, oh, in that I position. But also just because it's an educational institution it was um, you know, very uh, uh, exciting to think about being in a setting like that. I think most people have thought of their college years as some of the best years of their life, and why not work in a college if if your if your best years are college years? Uh, why not make that uh, a vocation? Yeah. Plus the you know the the fact that. Uh, it, uh, it was started as a, for a very particular, specific reason by, by uh, Norwegian Lutherans. The college. The college, to, uh, to educate uh, holistically, to, mm -hmm. to have the, you know, the intellectual and the, the physical and the spiritual all in balance. And that, uh, that's the, the genius of a Christian liberal arts college, I think, so. I went to one of them, St. Olaf, and uh, my wife went to one of them, Concordia, and we've had a lot of family members, pretty much every family member has gone to one of those kind of schools, so uh, so it's been part of our DNA, I guess. Yeah. In fact, my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather was one of the founders of St. Olaf oh. College, so, so it's really a part of our DNA, yeah. and a lot of family members have taught or worked at different Lutheran colleges. Okay. So let's um, talk a little bit about the changes that you've saw occur um, to Augsburg mm -hmm. in the, over the thirty years from nineteen eighty three. Mm -hmm. I should just double check. Do you think it's loud enough? Do you need to check to see? It looks if fine. It's coming through. Okay, yep. Good. Thank you. Yeah. I moved a little closer just in case. You... It looks fine. Okay. okay good. So, what was Augsburg like in 1983 versus now? Any um, systemic changes, cultural changes? Yeah. I could even back up further because when I was in high school, Augsburg was, uh, uh, was pretty basic. In fact, one of the famous stories was of Bernard Christensen was that uh, he you know, is a is legendary in terms of his in his his spirituality, but also his commitment to the city. Uh, so Augsburg has always had a commitment to the city, except maybe the first years when they were when they came and they were they were considered farmland because the center of the city was was uh, really at this at St. Anthony Falls. And this was on the outskirts of town, yeah. so you didn't have to make a commitment to the city. But the uh, um, Bernard Christensen was dating his wife. All right, I think I don't know the exact details, but maybe she was being brought in for an interview or what. Uh, she used to tell the story. Anyway, they went on a ride. She wanted to see Augsburg College, and it was it was a. Uh, you know, a long, long ride, and she said, "Well, are we ever going to get to Augsburg?" And and he said, "Oh, well, we went by it half an hour ago, <laughs> uh, but I was so I didn't really want to point it out because it's such a humble place." Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's Augsburg has has never pretended to blow people away with its facilities but uh, it's you know it's been it's, it has adequate facilities but it you know on a small campus like that you can't you can't show yourself yeah. off much so in college or high school they had just tremendous a uh, tremendous basketball team and, and in those days uh, the Minneapolis Lakers had already moved to Los Angeles there was no professional hockey so it was the front page of every sports section because of that tremendous basketball team, and you'd have to get to the to the gym a couple hours early mm. sometimes just to get a seat. Mm. And uh, we would come as a team, as mo as many uh, 
many basketball players would do. Uh, and in those days, uh, basketball was kind of king. Uh, and, and it was just the rocking place. And, and they had a big master plan out down in the basement of Melby Hall. Melby Hall had just been built. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was exciting to see that uh, what the Student Center, it's now Christensen Center, that the, the two tower dorms were going to be built and all these things. Because at that time it was only Old Main, mm -hmm. the Science Hall, uh, which uh, still is a Science Hall, the Library, which is uh, just around that other L part, and then the uh, Memorial Hall, which was a dormitory at that mm -hmm. time. Then I think across the street actually from uh, from uh, from the gym, Melby Hall was another dormitory that also might have been used by some of the nursing students that, uh, that were from St. Olaf mm -hmm. uh, that were going to uh, that were part, got part of their training at Fairview. But in between was just a lot of houses, and and of course Murphy Square, which is still. Mm -hmm. So it was it was it was not a real impressive place. When I came in '83, uh, of course the Christensen Center existed, the Tower Dorms existed, um, the Music Hall had just been built. In fact, we were part of uh, uh, my our denomination had some fingers in part of the building there, and they, uh, I don't know exactly what what the uh, arrangement was, but that they would use the Saturn Auditorium maybe for some of the, some things. Mm -hmm. So we, we came over and used that for showing of films and things like that. And then the old uh, building, which is now torn down, which was supposed to be very temporary, it was just a cinder block building, which was first a student center and then became the art building, and then uh, there was a bunch of offices very energy inefficient they discovered so they tore it down now it's just a parking lot right right next to the music building between the music building and Melby Hall so um, so there were not all that many buildings uh, Charles Anderson was president at that time but in 1983 uh, it was pretty lean uh, pretty lean time for Augsburg the, the number uh, the two uh, the uh, Admission numbers were down significantly uh, in '82 and '83, and uh, and they had to look for alternative ways to maybe raise revenue. And that, uh, and because they, you know, Augsburg never has had a, a large endowment, you're you're tuition driven. So the idea of weekend college came up, and that's when they started weekend college. And uh, a guy named Rick Tony, who's who's what I call Augsburg's magician, he he uh, was able to create a very large uh, number uh, attending weekend college. I think at one time it was 1,500 maybe. Um, That's a lot. Yeah, and um, and then when he became uh, vice president of enrollment management, he developed some other programs, scholarship programs especially, that brought in a, a wonderful new batch of students. And then when he went to Rochester to start the Rochester program again, he, he created magic. So at least three times in Augsburg's career, Rick Tony has kind of been the savior of, of Augsburg College, I think. And um, I just have the most admiration for him of, 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 of all people. He's just a, a wonderful, hardworking guy. But um, so Weekend College was cranking up. The numbers were starting to come back again. Um, right at that time, just about the time I started, just a little bit before, a fellow named Julian Foss, uh, who had gone to Augsburg Academy, not Augsburg College, but Augsburg Academy, which was uh, high school, uh, came on campus. And he said, where's the chapel? And uh, they said, well, we really don't have a chapel. We, there, there had been a chapel space, which is now the art uh, studio in Old Main. That was the chapel for the old Augsburg College and Augsburg Academy. Um, and Julian Foss had uh, 
been successful in investing, particularly in Nike shoes. And uh, he said, well, I'm willing to give, uh, uh, give quite a significant amount of money to, to have you build a center that would be a worship center, a theater mm -hmm. as a part of it, and a communications center as a part of it. He wanted all three in one. And, uh, and that was uh, the beginning of the thinking of, of uh, what's now Foss Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, so right after I had started, they form, we formed a committee and I, they asked if I would be on it. And of course I would as the chaplain. And um, the chair of the committee was the dean at the time, Richard Green. Richard Green took another position almost immediately. So that meant uh, uh, the president came to me and said, would you chair the committee? Hmm. Uh, which uh, was a great honor, but also a little bit uh, sensitive because I was representing one of the three interests that were going yeah. into the building there. So, but I, I it was, it was, uh, it was something I, I did accept. And, uh, and we had a, a hard working committee for five years to put that building together. Mm -hmm. We would have very early morning meetings, I think sometimes as early as 6.30, but often 7. Every Tuesday, the first part was just developing a charter so that it would talk about the usage of the building and primary to that, you know, so we had representatives from the faculty, uh, different departments representing uh, theater, communication, religion, and then other uh, disciplines as well. And the charter essentially ended up saying that this building is primarily for, for Augsburg students, you know, which was a wonderful statement, mm -hmm. a commitment to who we were about, and we, we made some strong statements about this Christian liberal arts heritage and a continuation of that. Uh, I think over the years that's kind of been lost because anytime uh, you you can see this as a as an opportunity to raise revenue, rent yeah. the space, sometimes uh, yeah. you kind of forget about those things. But um, uh, the biggest problem became putting the three spaces together mm -hmm. because for worship purposes you want spaciousness and light. For theater purposes mm -hmm. you want uh, smallness, intimacy, and darkness. So for a couple of years really we were trying to do things. Well I should even back up. Uh, I thought the only, you know, the model of this would be in two places because as all the architects made their proposals as to who we should select, uh, I studied carefully the buildings that they had done and I, I liked I liked a couple of spaces at Sov, Sov, Sovig Mathry, Sathrum, Kwanbeck and Schlink from Northfield uh, had done on two, two sister college campuses, mm -hmm. one St. Olaf and one Concordia. And Concordia was the centrum that, that was kind of a place, a gathering place. The chapel was primary to it, but they had other things there, uh, banquets, and it was, it was a part of the college center there. Uh, I think the dances and things like that. They had a nice balcony wrap, wrap around there. And then at St. Olaf, they had a similar space called the Ernest Recital Hall, and that was a part of the music building where recitals were held and small concerts. So um, we as a, we would visit different sites uh, that the architects were proud of, but um, we were invited down to, to St. Olaf, and we had lunch there, and then we sat in the afternoon and had our meetings in that Ernest Recital Hall. And, uh, and after the afternoon we said, this, this, is, this is what will work for us. So uh, we chose Sovik, Mathry, Sathrum, Kwanbeck, and Schlink, and Terry Schlink became our architect, and he was an Augsburg grad, which oh, was even... Oh, that's good. And actually the Kwanbeck in that firm was also an Augsburg grad, and he was the brother, Robert Kwanbeck, he was the brother of Phil Kwanbeck, Sr., who was, you know, very, a very distinguished Augsburg faculty member, now his son, 
Phil Klondike the second is is on the faculty in religion. Mm -hmm. But so there's a strong Augsburg connection to that firm, and um, it was uh, really uh, uh, it was fun working with them. But I think it was two years into it when we said, you know, it's just not going to work to combine these because yeah. we need uh, worship needs more space and more light. Theater needs more intimacy. And communications changes by the day, so it was going to be hard to have a communications center there. So we separated the spaces by uh, expanding the practice theater uh, and making it a big black box. And we figured if you needed a proscenium, and we had all kinds of reasons for that, because we would have had a hydraulic uh, stage that would go up for a proscenium stage, go down for uh, you know, an orchestra pit, and uh, we had all kinds of th things that would have worked, but then we talked to like people from Luther who said, well, we have, we have a hydraulic stage like that too, but whenever the air conditioning is on, it doesn't work, mm -hmm. it freezes. So, so there are reasons why we were a little hesitant in, in going that route. It, it would have been a beautiful concept, but, um, but then, what? How was our? How were our theater students going to get the experience on a proscenium stage? Well, there were seven theaters within walking distance of Augsburg College. They could, they could choose any one of them for those yeah. such. A, and that's again the advantage of being in the Twin Cities. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, Minneapolis is second only to, uh, or the Twin Cities second only to the, to New York for, yeah, for theater that. seats. Yeah. yeah. So there, there are lots of opportunities. And then communications has their own wing with the own. TV studio mm -hmm. and things like that. So the it, it the big question was would the donor go for that mm -hmm. scene he wanted, and that was the job of Charles Anderson, and he handled it beautifully. Mm. Uh, and and when the day of the dedication came, Julian Foss could not have been more Good. more pleased with what the turn up, uh, what what turned out. The product, yeah. So it it I think was a beautiful building. There were lots of bridges to cross, like would we put a basement in or would we just yeah. be on the ground floor like the music building? Would we go tile or would we, you know, go carpet? Well, we spent a dollar on a dollar because we knew that this was, you know, college building gets a lot of use yeah. and it might have to last a couple hundred years. <laughs> and it, it really, uh, it's proven to be a very, very welcoming building and, and, uh, Worked, worked really, really nicely, and people, people love. Uh, Hillary Clinton has been there twice for hmm. various reasons in that space. She really loves that space, so, so she has used that for a, a hearing once on, on uh, when she was in charge when her husband was elected president. You know, she was in charge of looking at the, the medical. Uh, changes or in a medical plan. Yeah, the healthcare. Yeah, yeah. healthcare, and she, so she used Augsburg as a, a Twin City spot for that, yeah. and then we've had Senate debates there and Governor debates. You yeah. know, so, lots of nice, nice opportunities. Great concerts, and of course, chapel every day. Yeah, that's good. That that oh, excuse me. Well, that might be a good segue. Um, yeah. Let Let's talk about campus ministries, uh, and chapel and. <laughs> However you'd like to um, describe, what, what's the role of campus ministries? Yeah, well, you know, it is a good segue because uh, uh, there was no chapel, a building. So the chapel met three days a week, and it uh, was either in the gymnasium, Malby Hall. There was a, one third of that was sectioned off, you, you could pull the curtain and they pull an altar out and they could pull the bleachers or in Saturn Auditorium or the cafeteria. We used the cafeteria eventually most of the time uh, because it was right in the center of campus and that was all before we moved into the new building. But we were only meeting three days a week. I think Augsburg College is probably the only college in the country that actually added chapels. Mm -hmm chapel services. So we went to five days mm -hmm. a week, and that was by unanimous vote of the faculty okay. back in 19, um, 
probably 1977, the year before we moved in, in 78. And that, that, you know, that's sort of unheard of because even some of our sister colleges, Lutheran colleges even took like a day away, so, so they might have four-day chapel or three-day chapel, but we went from three to five, which, uh, which I think is quite remarkable. Um, obviously, Augsburg, given its, its uh, profile, its demographics, there's a lot of commuters, so a lot of people just kind of come in and go out according to their class because they also have jobs mm -hmm. uh, to, to go to. So it's not a re residential community as such. That back, we could back up again and say, you know, since 83, they built a number of new residence halls. So you have Anderson Hall, you have what's now Luther Hall, and they used to call it New Hall, and I thought they, you know, they should have said instead of N-E-W-G-N-U, and then they could have celebrated some of the animals that run around <laughs> Africa. And then, of course, uh, over at Oren Gateway, there's there's residential space. So that was in an effort, again, kind of a Rick Tony idea, to bring more students to create a, an on-campus community. But um, one of the one of my thoughts was, okay, if we if we're not going to have uh, a community every day at ten twenty or eleven twenty on Tuesday and Thursday in those days. Um, you know, we need to create communities elsewhere. So I, 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 we we put a lot of effort into into other uh, our presence in other places. You know, I uh, would like to. Uh, I tried to eat at the cafeteria almost every day. You know, and, and and we had got I got to know people that way and and hear their needs and become a part of various communities that way. We got invited to a lot of communities, but particularly in the athletic community, we, uh, we became uh, important. And uh, I, well, one of the big changes uh, was there was no football field, no athletic field when I came, but a guy named G. Roy Carlson and some of his friends G. Roy is what we call Mr. Augsburg, and he was once, uh, um, I think, in charge of alumni, and then he became a fundraiser, and he's the guy that raised uh, most of the money for a lot of the projects there, like the uh, Lindell Library and the Athletic Field and things like that. Uh, they figured that they could, they could, by tearing a couple of houses down and by by refiguring some things, they could get a, an athletic field, and they did. So they were playing their games at the football games, and, and I think maybe soccer too, at Parade Stadium downtown. So we suddenly had a football field, and they needed an announcer. So um, they asked if I'd be the announcer. So I, I was, and I still am actually, an announcer for football, basketball, and wrestling. But... Uh, but uh, I would meet with the team before the home games, and we'd have a, a devotional time, and that goes on to this day with a guy named Mike Madsen, who now is uh, part-time at Augsburg as a chaplain to athletes, and also uh, in the working with us as a strength coach. And then he's a pastor across the freeway now at Bethany Lutheran Church. Uh, so we, I, I had many opportunities to meet with the athletic teams uh, on their turf, but then a lot of them then come to chapel on the days of their games or the day before their games, too. So there's there was a real symbiotic relationship with uh, athletics, and that was kind of again in the concept of okay, if if not everybody has the opportunity to come to chapel every day, we can create chapels for them around the campus. So that. Uh, that is uh, a long way of yeah. saying how Augsburg is probably unique in their campus ministry to a lot of other colleges. Yeah. Okay, that's a great point. <clears throat> so I, you know, I, I sometimes judge things by how many references I'm asked to 
write per year and how many <laughs> weddings I, I'm asked to do. And, and uh, you know, I, I could easily do four to 500 references a year for, <laughs> for um, students that were going on to graduate school yeah. or summer jobs yeah. or things like that. And uh, weddings, you know, one time I just counted how many it could have done in one summer, and I think it was 47 or 48 just mm -hmm. in a summer. And yeah. uh, so, you know, you, <clears throat> it was, it was a, as a result of entering into right. the worlds of, of uh, students that might not automatically wind their way over to the right. chapel. So you took chapel to them. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> that's I great. think that's... Um, it's like a food food truck, a chapel truck. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, one more question before we leave the ministry um, topic. How does a Lutheran college find ways to be inclusive of all religious beliefs? Yeah, well, um, I think... Uh, you know, there's different slants to Lutheranism, and especially uh, as you look at the different uh, countries that have uh, been represented in Lutheranism. Uh, you know, you look at Northern Europe in particular, and and um, I'll try to not draw this out. I could talk about this for hours <laughs> because a lot of a lot of Lutherans have not been very receptive to everybody, you know, because in Norway there's so many valleys. Some people have just gotten so used to living in their own valley and using mm -hmm. their own dialect and things like that that, that they didn't see any need to yeah. do that. But Lutheran theology uh, really is is based on on uh, grace and 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 uh, openness. Um, uh, and acceptance, un, you know, God's unearned love and favor is the definition of grace. And, and um, I think I, I look at uh, um, Luther's explanation to the third article, which is the explanation to the third part of the creed, which is about the Holy Spirit. And it, it goes like this. I believe I cannot, by my own understanding or effort, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit calls me through the gospel, enlightens me with gifts, sanctifies and keeps me in true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it united with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. And that, it goes on a little bit more. But basically, I think the way we as Lutherans operate is we say, okay, we cannot coerce people through formulas, religious formulas or whatever, but if we allow people to have the gospel in their hands, the gospel calls us, you know, so we're called through the gospel. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's one of the more uh, uh, amazing Lutherans, of course, he, he was killed in standing up to Hitler as a martyr, and, and he chose to go back to, uh, to, you know, the whole story, to Germany after having kind of a nice position in New York. Um, he... In his letters and papers to prison, there's a point at, towards the end that said, you know, maybe sometimes I tried to push the gospel on people or to coerce people, but the gospel can stand on its own. And I think that's the approach that Lutherans, okay, we, we, we can be very open, we respect people for where they stand, but we, we also uh, allow... Uh, because of being a confessional church, we gather around the confessions, the things we, we agree on, and the things we don't agree on, you know, uh, the gospel can inform us all, and, you know, and we're all in kind of a growth pattern in, 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 in our faith. So I think, um, I think Augsburg has, by and large, been uh, pretty good at being accepting and non-judgmental of of uh, of the way you do your you know your your religion your faith your spirituality uh, I don't know if that answered the question quite no I think it did uh, um, what if any influence um, does the location of Augsburg in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood um, 
impact what you just said about um, the mix of cultures or ethnicities? Or? Yeah. Well, you know, I, being a, a, a kid that has, uh, you know, went to an inner city high school in St. Paul, uh, I, I guess I've thought of Augsburg as being a part of even a broader community than just, mm -hmm. and certainly the Cedar Riverside community is important, mm -hmm. but you look at the Phillips, we built a, a home in the Phillips with Habitat for Humanity one year, it was in conjunction with some uh, agencies and churches there, um, you know, and that's a very large Native American community. Mm -hmm. so I've, I've heard that probably the largest collection of Native Americans even in in the Midwest, uh, even more so than some reservations. Um, but then you go to St. Paul and you have the Hmong uh, yeah. collection, which, uh, you know, second largest only to, second only to uh, California. The Liberians, uh, largest uh, collection uh, or concentration uh, in the country, so it's it's it it uh, the profile of the Twin Cities, you know, since 1983 has changed from, I think, it, less than five percent of the population. I think significantly less than five. I think I heard the other day 17 or 18, mm -hmm. maybe even 19 percent of the population. So that that has that has been primarily, of course, in the Twin Cities. So yes, Cedar Riverside is one part of it, but uh, but it's it's it goes far beyond that. And uh, and uh, the students have done remarkable things with uh, finding their ways into into the various communities. Cedar Riverside being primary, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Seward also, you know, is, is... We used to have something called Ministries on the Mississippi, and it was the churches of Cedar Riverside, Seward, and over on the university uh, campus. So we would have um, uh, University of Minnesota campus ministry, Lutheran campus ministry, the Lutheran chaplains from the, the university hospitals, University Church of Hope, Grace Church on the university campus. We had Bethany, we had Augsburg, and we had Trinity that worships at Augsburg, and a couple of other entities also. So that brought three basic communities together, and we did some some projects and things like that together for quite a few years. What kinds of projects? Um, it was... Uh, well, I, you know, probably more, uh, more things about. Um, well, we we did Latin worships and things, you know, the worshiping type things together. But we we did. Uh, um, uh, you know, kind of social things, trips down the river and, and things like that. Kind of celebrating the river. Um, there were. Um, I think maybe some habitat things going on, some youth, you know, combined some some uh, combined youth activities, and uh, um, I can't. It's been a while now since That's okay. addressing That's okay. the some young adult issues as young adults would come to the Twin Cities. We had a young adult uh, transition center. I actually uh, created that where we had. A couple, three houses on our campus, uh, and young adults that would come to the Twin Cities could live there for a short period of time as they were being transitioned in the cities. And then we'd do, once a week we'd have uh, activities for them at night. Um, uh, you know, you know, one of the unique things about Augsburg is they, they, they're able, they're flexible, we are flexible enough to try so many things. Yeah. And uh, and sometimes things work and sometimes things don't work, you know. So. <laughs> but the but a lot there were environmental <laughs> projects, you know, along the river there, and there were, um, they just, you know, they were there were a lot of, a lot of different, uh, some some food programs. I remember Thanksgiving dinners uh, for the community. 
and was at Bethany. You know, we were just, you know, there were, between housing and food and environmental things, there were lots of, lots of things going on. Yeah, the, um, so the adult, Young Adult Transition Center, they were for, um, they were not students? No, not students. They, they were just neighborhood. Oh. Yeah, okay. so people coming in from from uh, Winter, South Dakota, you know, okay. would have the chance to have a place to live for yeah. for two, three months. Yeah, so, so they got their feet on the yeah, ground. Yeah. yeah, that's very nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, so the, you were involved in the urban basketball. Yeah. Would that, would that fit in with what yeah, you were describing? Yeah, that would be another, another you know, uh, thing. Yeah, we... Uh, uh, it was a tournament. Do you want to talk? Well, about we that? had, uh, yeah, we started. One of the things I did, uh, I gather youth uh, professionals. I call them professionals because they could be pastors or youth directors. Once a month for what's called the youth ministry roundtable, and that was right away when when I started. There's a guy named Jim Grubbs who also had a youth background. He was with Young the Young Life organization, and I had been more focused on the churches. So we had we brought in people that might help uh, illumine uh, you know, the people who were in youth ministries in their in their job, and then out of that, you know, I, I saw all of these uh, church gyms back in the '80s. I counted uh, of just our denomination. There, there were I think uh, oh I better not even say the number, but I think I think thirty some church gyms, and a lot of them were not being used mm -hmm. on Sunday afternoons. So we gathered these youth uh, professionals, a lot of them had been a part of our round table, and said, well, let's see what we can do to start a league, because so many uh, young people have learned to love basketball. For instance, in this particular area, there's a thousand kids playing in the basketball association but then by the time you get to high school, you only have a handful. Mm -hmm. So what about all those others that have learned to love basketball? So maybe we could do some things in the church. So that that uh, was, uh, you know, we had a thousand kids playing. And, yeah, and that's amazing. In, the, uh, in this, on Sunday afternoons for January and February, and then we have the big tournament in March mm -hmm. at Augsburg. So the, it was always a big fiesta. Yeah. <laughs> it was a great, great, and yeah. It's. Uh, what, I think it's scaled back a bit now, but I think it's still still going. So that do you think that increased Augsburg's visibility amongst those? Yeah, yeah. It was a great relation, a great thing for the community because they were primarily city churches. There was a nice mix mm -hmm. of suburban and city because this, some of the suburban churches had beautiful gyms and they really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was a nice mixture, not without problems. You know, mm -hmm. anytime you're in com competition. Uh, lots of funny things can happen. Like but, what? Well, you know, people think that winning is the most important thing. Oh, so yeah. we we had a whole different set of rules. We had equal equal playing time, for, so everyone had had to get equal playing mm -hmm. time. We had started with devotions, ended with devotions and prayer. Mm -hmm. We had a service project that were highly. We tried to build them into every every team mm -hmm. uh, uh, concept. And uh, but occasionally people took the game a little too seriously, and they, you know, so so we kept addressing that. But uh, a lot of there's a lot of benefits for for uh, the students. Uh, uh, you know, we would when the tournament went on, we'd have a hundred some Augsburg students you know, running it. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of them were involved during the season too, as yeah. as uh, gym managers and and coaches and refs and things like yeah, that. It sounds so, like a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. A, it was a tremendous uh, thing. And uh, and a lot of them, a lot of those kids in the league came came to Augsburg because yeah, they that's were what introduced I was to Augsburg. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> well, good. That sounds like a very very good program. Yeah. Um, what would you, so now focusing on you, your career there, um, what would you describe as, or could you tell me about some of the challenging times in the 30 years from 1983 to 2013? 
Well, I, th I think the, the biggest challenge uh, is um, people that don't, have, don't totally understand uh, the genius of uh, Christian Laborts College. And there are people that come in, uh, and I think now they're uh, trying to address it, uh, and at least on the faculty side, by having a mission committee. So uh, if a faculty member is interviewing, they also are being interviewed by the mission committee to, so that they will understand what it means to be a part of Augsburg College, knowing its heritage as a Christian liberal arts school. Uh, but there are people that come in and they have a whole different model in mind, and that would not include the spiritual component. Mm -hmm. So that manifests itself in different ways, and that's another <laughs> many-hour conversation. Okay. But uh, so that's what the mission committee um, their task then to to introduce the new faculty to. Yeah, uh, help me. Explain that's part. That. Yeah, the mission committee. I think it still exists. So, so, if a prospective faculty member is is interviewing, they also are being interviewed by the mission committee uh, for the spiritual aspect. Just to understand, not just the spiritual aspect, but the whole mission of the college. Oh, the you know, mission what, of the college. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what is the mission of the college? Well, the mission, uh, you know, would subscribe to the mission statement, you know, and, uh, and that, that has changed over the years, but the, the current mission statement, I think, is different under this administration. And okay. Each, each administration sure. changes that. I but, understand. Uh, yeah. Um, so that, that was one of the challenges. Anything else that comes to mind? Well, um, Over 30 years, I'm sure there must have been a lot. But. I can say, I still don't sleep through the night because I was interrupted. I'm sure for 30 years I was interrupted pretty much every night uh, and sometimes many times a night, you know, for, phone the, calls. for the crises. Phone calls or running to a hospital because of um, an accident or, okay. or someone that was was trying to harm themselves yeah. or something like that. So it was... Um, so you were had a role of a counselor? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, in dealing with... You know, there, 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 there's a lot of bad stuff that happens on, yeah. in a city college campus. Yeah. Uh, any college campus, but city, there's a lot of... A lot of things that were... Uh, were... Uh, uh, you know... might want to turn that off. I think I'm going to get a message. Crowley, you've reached the wall Please leave your message and leave your number twice. Sorry okay. about that. Okay, that's all right. Yeah. Um, all right, and then the rewarding experiences over 30 years. Yeah. Well, there were rewards every day, you know. First of all, it's... It's just a stimulating place to be, you know, yeah. and you you learn something new every day. The people that uh, uh, I met, uh, you know, were uh, gifts. So many were gifts. Can't say everyone, but but uh, it was just uh, it was just uh, amazing. What uh, take a look outside here. And you can see. Skating around the lake. The uh, it, it was uh, you know just some amazing amazing stories, just yeah. some amazing stories, and to see you know many were going from point A to point Z and and uh, the students students you know in terms of intellectual, yeah. physical and spiritual development and, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, there's just, uh, I just uh, heard in the last 24 hours from a, a couple who, who, you know, one was 
person who lived on the streets, you know, now getting PhD. You know. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, and it uh, had no high school degree. And just it just kind of yeah. amazing stories. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um. Well, I think we'll wrap it up here shortly. What do you think? Two two more questions. How is the perspective of a pastor different? of the students, um, the perspective of the students different than that of the faculty or the administration? How is the perspective, uh, from the pastor standpoint, you mean? Yeah. Well, I was in a unique position, and I think, uh, I think all college pastors and Lutheran college campuses are probably in this position, where you're really in a position of neutrality. Mm. You're... you're you are considered faculty, but you're also considered administration. You know, you're kind of mm -hmm. you you um, you have a foot in both, but but uh, you you can be uh, a listening ear. You can also at times probably be a take the profit role if you see that something needs to be challenged or mm -hmm. or spoken. To some issue, some injustice, uh, you know. So, you know, there, uh, essentially, uh, it, it's a it's a difficult position at times when some when somebody comes to you with an issue about a faculty member. That's uh, that's uh, it's a safe place to come, but then it becomes a, a very difficult to know exactly how yeah. how to resolve everything there are processes in you know mostly in place but not always um, there are there are people um, I discovered over the years there are people who just have a axe to grind with their with religion and um, they have found a way to to uh, probably direct their hostility towards a chaplain mm -hmm. because of that. So there's, uh, yeah, there, you know. That must be hard. There, there's, it's not been without pain. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but it's, it's 97% joy. That's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. um, and then last question, what would you consider your legacy? that you left at Oxford? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. <clears throat> one, one of the things that I learned from my father, who learned from his father, was that, you, that um, the, the most important thing a person possesses is their name. Yeah. And, uh, and I worked hard at trying to know people's names <clears throat> and that was it really when I say worked hard it wasn't working hard I basically for the the early years we had directories and then because of confidentiality issues and things like mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um, they eliminated that but there's still ways you know that you can get pictures and know who people mm -hmm. are through uh, you know electronic devices uh, through you know the, through IT etc you know, programs, athletic programs, etc. So I would pray for students systematically. Mm, great. Um, regularly, every day, every morning, every night. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that, uh, um, you can learn people's names that way, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. So you're not only just praying for, for them, you're learning their name. Yeah. So... And then you, it's hard to be angry with people when you know their name. Yeah. Because you know they have a name. Yeah. And there's, they have a mother. Yeah. And, and they're, they're, they're a child of God and they're, they're, they're on this earth for a reason. And then they all have been given gifts and there's, it's just that, you know, it's, uh, it, it, you can see the, you can see 
potential. You can see the good in every individual, I guess, because of that. And and it was uh, it, it was fun to watch the that potential uh, emerge you know, yeah. into full into yeah. full blown um, action. So I guess that would be one of the things. And I, I think if um, I maybe would say grit, you know, there there's it was there were easier jobs in the world. I was offered many jobs along the line that, that would have right? paid me considerably more. But it would it just seemed like it was a, a rare opportunity yeah. again. It, and some people call it vocation, some people yeah. call it calling, but I, I think that whole thing has gotten a little bit confusing because they've used it so much that, uh, <laughs> yeah. but there are rare opportunities to come along. This was a rare opportunity for me. That's and, great. And it was uh, one that I, I really loved uh, seizing. So. Okay. Um, anything you'd like to add um, about your experience that we haven't discussed? Let me look at it, Ron. You know, Advent Vespers is kind of an uh, yeah. amazing thing. I'd maybe like to tell you a little bit about okay. that. Um, that started in 1980. I came in 1983, so three of them had gone on before. And a guy named Larry Fleming mm -hmm. was the uh, genius behind that. He had been at uh, Valparaiso, and he had also been at Concordia as, as a director of uh, uh, one of the choirs up there. But he, he had this idea that, that you could, because the Central Lutheran Church, which is just a magnificent uh, mm -hmm. structure, that they could maybe do something unique at Augsburg. And uh, so I it was basically on the ground floor. I mean, three years had gone before, but there, was, there were only two services, maybe even one uh, at one time. And people were just starting to get the word about it. And, and there's a lot of movement with the choirs, but then the liturgy became a very important part of it. So mm -hmm. developing a theme was uh, one of my challenges with with the the person uh, directing the uh, the choirs or in charge of the of that aspect of it. They, there are many choir directors usually involved, but. Um, we saw it grow uh, to three, and then to four, and now to five. Yeah. And it's it's. Uh, yeah. And we because we have a theme using that setting and and really focusing on allowing the gospel to speak, being called by the gospel again. Uh, you know, the, there's I, I just hear countless numbers of people who who you know have really understood the gospel in different ways, in new ways. You know, uh, so many people, so many pastors and choir directors have called me and asked, can I use this reading? Can we use, yeah. do this for our Christmas service and things like that? Because this is the first weekend mm -hmm. in December. So that that was really, and that was something that I was always, as I was reading and looking for things that I could use for, to kind of tie mm -hmm tie things together with the music and stuff like that as we develop the theme. That that was that was a pure joy. That was and and maybe hopefully that's part of a legacy too because I think it's real easy. Most colleges have a concert, but this is a service. Yeah. So it's different. So we in and, and it was many people wanted to have a concert, you know, uh, but it's a, it's a service. Yeah. It's it still is a service. Um, and when you speak about legacy, I think you look at Augsburg and it's because of the legacy of so many amazing people who I knew about in high school just because you hear about Augsburg College and you heard names that went along with mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. uh, probably more so than any other college. It's, it's, it's that relation, you know, when you hear about St. Thomas, Maybe you hear the same thing, but but I think Augsburg is unique with the names that have built the place, and just the trad you know traditions and just the connections and 
you know, the um, one of one of the other persons I just heard from here this week was is this is a doctor who's who, with her husband who's also a doctor, and another group of doctors are establishing a whole health system in Burundi. You know? Oh, is that right? Yeah, and they had to learn the language, and they just felt called to do that. And you see how they're really making a difference in this world. It, it, it's just amazing to see see how people have have really um, impacted the world. And, and, and maybe it would have happened in another place, but I think it was... I think it was Augsburg and just kind of a sense of of uh, what you should do with that education that, that allows people to do those sorts of things. That's a nice summation. Anything else? No. Oh, the Bunch of Guys Chorus. Yeah. <laughs> that's still going strong and people love it and, and uh, that's created a lot of... Well, tell me how that started. Was it your well, idea? Yeah, I, you know, I just, I, at, so often in athletic events, you'll have a soloist, right, who sometimes may not realize, um, or they might forget the words, <laughs> or they, or they might try to do make a performance out of it. That's true. Or they play a tape, and one day, you know, twenty-five, twenty-five years at least. Maybe more uh, ago, I said, I thought to myself, you know, it's a real privilege to to sing the national anthem, and uh, and uh, why don't I just invite, especially because I was doing male athletic events, mm -hmm. any guy in the audience that want, wanted to do that. Now I had I had set this up so that I at least had a few good singers, there. <laughs> and pretty soon a lot of people who had never sung in their life, you know, had. Mm -hmm came and joined us, and just the thrill of singing the national anthem is amazing. So do you, do you sing along with music, or? Yeah, like, yeah, um, well, I have, it's two-part music, Yeah. and they bring them down, I'm, they come right around me, and, and for the foot, on the football field, I go down the field with, yeah. the, with the remote mic, and then in the basketball and wrestling, they just come and surround me at the table, mm. but it's, uh, we've had as many as 200 guys, that'd be is a that record. Ring? But, you know, usually it's a, a dozen guys or something like mm -hmm. that, sometimes. Or for football, it would be more than that, but for basketball. But it's it's a powerful thing, and it's really, especially for veterans who have served mm -hmm. the country, to mm -hmm. to be able to do that uh, is is really, uh, it's a neat thing. It's, mm -hmm. a neat, it's a neat thing to see. And for younger younger ones that join in, they have a sense of uh, of the magnitude of of what a national anthem. Yeah, that's is very true. Yeah. Yeah. So I like. <clears throat> Are you still um you still do that? Oh yeah. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Very much. Yeah. What were you gonna say? Sorry. No, I guess um, I guess that's that's something that really surprised me and on how how important that became to so many people. Yeah. <laughs> it's very unique, very, um, very special, very yeah, distinctive. Yeah, it's, it, it's distinctive. Yeah. yeah. I think, I don't know if anyone else has ever done it, but I think some might be trying it now. So, <laughs> yeah. It's caught on. Yeah. Anything else? No, I appreciate, uh, okay. I appreciate you being interviewed. It's, well, it's nice to. Well, thank you. I'll do this. That concludes our session.